Has everybody enjoyed this semester? Is it good? Would you do it again? Raise your hand if you would do it again. That's not enough hands. I shouldn't have asked that. Well, uh, as, uh, as first of all, give it up for Mark Seastrand, Tom McDonald, and everyone here at UVU. And President Holland, who's been amazing. I always tell people UVU is the most entrepreneurial school in the state of Utah. And President Holland's the best president we have in Utah. So the second, that's the second thing, that, that President Holland being the best university president in the state of Utah, that's actually true. The first thing that's kind of subjective, so you're going to have to... You're going to have to prove me right there that, you, that UVU is the most entrepreneurial school. I graduated from here, so let's, uh, let's make UVU proud. Uh, so as, as Tom mentioned, uh, Josh is back, Kurtz, and uh, he had a whole thing planned, and we would have loved to have him, but uh, when, it, when he sent it the text this morning and said he couldn't come, I knew we had to get someone even better, and we did. And Chris Harrington, who has, has been with Josh for 15 years, uh, started with Josh at Omniture. Uh, Josh convinced him to come over to Domo. Seriously, we are so lucky to have Chris Harrington here. Please give it up for the president of Domo, Chris Harrington. All right, hey, thank you so much. Appreciate the kind introduction. Again, my name is Chris Harrington. Um, I'm the president of Domo. As he said, I joined uh, Josh at Omniture in 2002. I'll just give you a little, more, a little bit more about my background. In 2002, Omnitru was doing about a million and a half in new business. I was employee 38, and we were losing fistfuls of money, uh, buckets, and then some suitcases full of money. It was, it was atrocious. Um, and I came in to, to uh, lead up sales. I had four employees on my team, and we took it from there at a million and a half in 2002. Uh, we took it public in 2006. In 2009, uh, we were at $340 million in, rev in recurring revenue, and we sold to Adobe for $1.8 billion. Josh left right away. I served a two-year prison term, uh, sorry, earnout uh, with Adobe. But one year, my job, was to, uh, my, my, my job was to actually not come to work. So. I'm just I'm thinking here, as you kind of go out and you start negotiating your, your contracts and your agreements later on, if you can write that in there, that when you leave, you actually have a year of pay where you actually don't go to work, do that. It's an amazing gig. Uh, my, you know, my, my wife and I, my, my now wife and I, we took a year. We kind of traveled around the world. I grew long hair, which I just cut off, grew an amazing beard. Um, but we traveled, uh, we traveled over the place. I started, I started selling in 1988. Who wasn't born in 1988 in here? Aye, aye, see? I'm 48 years old tomorrow. Tomorrow's my birthday, turned 48. But I started selling Ginsu knives. You ever, anyone ever seen those? You know, those knives you can, cut a, you can cut a can in half and then you can cut a tomato with it. So that's where I started selling. And I took on a leadership, and it was a, it was a telemarketing role in Cedar City, Utah. And then I took on leader, sales leadership roles. Um, and, you know, had, have been in sales leadership and, and executive management since then. Um, today, I want to kind of talk to you about five key things. Uh, people, instincts, sales, competition, and then I'll wrap up with culture. Um, and then we'll open it up for some, for, for some Q&A as well. I want to start talking about people. And, and again, the reason I want to start here, because... Normally, when you're in a conversation about entrepreneurship, you start really, you, you kind of think, well, let's start with culture. I want to end there, because with, with the wrong culture, you really, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's more of a cautionary tale, where if you, if you get the culture wrong, <laughs> you're, in, you're in some serious trouble. So we're to end there, but I want to talk about people, because at, at the very foundation of what, we're, what we build, it's the people. And the reason, that, the reason I want to focus here is because... Uh, it's easy to hire wrong. I don't know if that makes sense, especially if you're hiring salespeople, right? Salespeople are the worst, and since I'm one of them, I'll tell you some secrets about us, right? Like, we know how to sell. And so if we know how to sell a third-party product, if we know how to sell Ginsu knives, guess what else we know how to sell? Us. 
right? And we know how to look for your weaknesses as you're, as you're going off and you're starting a business. We know how to look for the things that, that, you, that we know you want. And we know how to focus in on those things because we're trying to get a job. And what I would caution you on some, you know, again, around hiring and around salespeople, involve a lot of people in that process, right? At, at Domo, I don't know if anyone here has interviewed through the Domo process. It is a gauntlet. Uh, I'm the last person to interview anybody that, 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 uh, that gets hired at Domo on the sales or our client services side, the last person. And the rule is if anybody in the process says no for any reason, before they get to me, they don't get to me, right? And I mean, for some of my very basic roles, there, there are seven people in that process, just for, a, for an account development role, just somebody that's banging phones, trying to get leads. I have seven people that will interview these people before they get to me. And when we get done, every time somebody interviews them, that person walks out of the room and we ask, and, the, and that person, that, the person who did the interview completes uh, a forum and says, what are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? Would I hire them? And are they what we call a domo sapien, which again goes back to our culture. Now, why do we involve so many people in that process? Because interviewing is a thing that if you, if you do it enough and you're lazy about it, you can start asking just standard basic questions that are never getting you insights into who this person is and how they're going to be when they perform in a team environment. Um, so we focus really in intently on this. I want to talk about a couple times where we've made bad hires. And I'll give you two examples, right? Um, I serve on the board at Domo, but I also serve on a board of a company in Austin uh, called Spreadfast. And there was a, uh, we were hiring for a CFO. CFO is a huge role uh, when, you're, you know, when you're a technology company, any company. So it's a, it is, I would argue, and I would never tell my CEO, CFO this because I don't want to admit it in front of him, but it's, it, is, it is arguably more important than my role, right? And if you, make a, if you make a mistake here, it's a problem. Well, we were hiring somebody that, again, this, this company's in Austin. We are hiring someone, and everyone, everyone felt like, ah, he looks great. His pedigree's amazing. Do you see where he went to college? Do you see all these rewards? Do you see everything that, you know, all the awards that this man's received? Um, but in the end, there was an instinct that said, hey, I don't know if this is the right guy. And we all went against that instinct because the pedigree spoke so strongly that we made a bet. And you know what happens when you make a, when you make a bet on a, on a human, on a role that significant uh, in a company that's trying to raise capital, that's trying to grow? <laughs> it, is, it is a tragic move. Right? And you lose years. Right? You lose years. Because guess what happens? These, these people also come with massive, you know, massive packages um, in terms of compensation. You've got to eat all that stuff when you, make a, you, know, when you overcorrect. And we all went against our instincts. Does that make sense? Right? When you're an entrepreneur or when you're a leader, you have a certain set of instincts about people, about customers. Right? And unless you're a horrible leader, or a horrible entrepreneur, you've got to assume your instincts are good, right? Because you'll fine tune them all the time. So it leads me, leads me into the next thing, which is, the, which is instincts. Don't bet against your instincts. I don't know if that's, you know, I don't know if that makes a lot of sense. But if you have something, if your heart or something tells you, hey, this person's not right for us. I don't care what my board says. I don't care what LinkedIn says. I don't care, you know. My gut says something's wrong. I'd, I'd move a different direction. Uh, so go back into my second prayer, second question, or the second example on this, uh, this people issue. Uh, I was at a company once, and we hired a CMO. Again, critical role. Um, and in the process, we had a ton of people telling us, telling us how amazing this person was. But they weren't hiring him. That's the other thing. They were selling him a lot, but they weren't hiring him. Um, that's also something else to click on a lot. If someone doesn't hire someone they're pushing on you, you want to maybe look, look, look deeper into that. Um, and in the end, we went, we, this person wasn't local. And again, I know it's, a, you know, it's 2017. I know you can do, do business from anywhere. But in a leadership role like that, you kind of need to be a corporate. You need to be there. 
wasn't local, was flying in, flying out, wasn't involved in the culture of the organization, wasn't involved in, like, you just sit down and watch, watch like, the lunchroom. <laughs> wasn't talking with people. And it was, a, it was a disaster. And again, the instincts, everything said, don't do this. We had two board members so aggressively pushing us to make this decision. So we did it, right? You're the person. You're the leader. If you have instincts, you need to speak up. Sometimes you'll be in a situation where some of you won't end up becoming entrepreneurs. You'll go, you'll, you'll go lead an organization. You'll, you'll, do, you know, you'll be a president. You'll run sales, whatever it is. But you need to speak up. Your responsibilities are to speak up when you're feeling these things. You need to say something. Does that make sense? All right. This, is this coming through? Working? All right, maybe more clever on this next one, I think. I'm going to talk about sales. Um, how many of you, because uh, there's also a sales program here, right? How many of you are in that sales program? Anybody? Uh, no nobility in this room at all. Okay. Marketing? Ay, ay, ay. Creeps. Okay, all right. Engineering, okay. Engineering and sales are the only noble professions. Okay, you can write that down, tweet it. It's truth, it's truth. Um, and since there's only a couple people in here for marketing, and I, if you're offended, please contact Human Resources. Um, but, you know, the only cool thing about being in marketing is you get to work with crayons. Right? It's really, all right, all right. Some of these jokes are just for me, but that's a good one. That's a good one. All right, I want to go into sales. Again, sales, you know, you go and you start a company, and you've got this amazing vision about a product and about the market and about what you're going to create and what you're going to offer. And so you go and you hire engineers, and you sit down with creative people, and you're building a product, and you're rolling, you're, you're, you, you get everything ready. It doesn't, you know, nothing, none of that matters. It doesn't matter how amazing your product is or how great your marketing is or how amazing anything, how much money you've raised, none of that matters until you've actually sold something. And so it's an, it's an interesting thing because as I go, so again, I'm on, you know, I'm on two boards, but also advisor on four of the companies, and there's some consistencies that I start seeing. When I start, I start watching companies that have some dysfunction in the leadership, for example, right, where there's, like, there's contention, there's what, whatever's going on. And almost all the time, those things are solved by setting people out on the road to sell. Now, why is that valuable? Why, I mean, besides getting a purchase order, getting cash, et cetera, from, a, from selling something, why is selling so valuable? Any thoughts on that? It does. It validates the business to an extent. Absolutely. Great point. What else? Yes, sir. Revenue, right? Without revenue, you're you know, pretty much going to die soon. So I agree with that. Revenue's, revenue's amazing. You learn. Who said that? Amazing. In school, you learn. And the, the, to, me, to me, this is the most important thing, right? Because you're actually hearing from your customers what they think about what you've just created, what they think about what you're saying, what they think about your offer. You're learning about how the product may not work to solve their needs, how your competition is stacking up against you and what they're doing, right? But I also think that also there's an argument about executive selling, entrepreneurs going out and selling, because you're gonna, you, by the time you go out and you build a sales force and they go out there and they come back to you and they tell you what's going on, that's filtered. It's going to filter from the sales rep's mind and his translation of what's going on. It's going to get filtered again by the time it goes through the, his, his sales manager, potentially a sales VP before it gets to you, for you to be able to make some decisions off of that. So I believe one, one foundation is for you to get, actually get out and be in the field. Go on some sales calls, especially if it's not who you are. Right? If you're an engineer, guess what? You don't love selling. Right? That's why you chose it, because if, if not, you'd have chose sales, because it's the most amazing profession ever, right? Um, but the reason I think that's so valuable is because you actually start to, you, you start to gain insights you simply cannot get by coding. You cannot get by sitting in a room building. When you start hearing customers talk about your product, it is so valuable. 
we just did Domo Palooza. Uh, it's a, our big annual event uh, where we bring our customers together. We had 3,000 people up at the Grand America. And the very last session of that event is a customer feedback session where we actually turn the mics over and customers tell us what they like about the product, what they want to see, what they believe we can be doing better. It is the most impressive component. And we had Macklemore this year. Macklemore threw down. We had Jason Derulo. And I'm, look, bro, it's pretty. And I mean, but that session was so much more valuable because the customers were being so clear about what they need and about what they want. So I'm telling you, get out there and sell. Does that make sense? OK. Competition. Competition. Um, you know, for me, competition is a 24-hour-a-day deal. And it's not just about getting out and out-marketing your competition. To me, it's, it's, a, it's a real mental game. You want to know what they're doing, what's working for them, what's not working. You know, for me, I go way deeper than that. I have a sickness. I actually, actually go, I actually, my goal is to make sure my competition is thinking about me when they go to sleep. Now, I know that sounds, I know it's, it's, it's I mean, it is funny because I'm clever, but, it, but, it's, <laughs> but it's true. I actually want them to worry about me and think about what I'm doing. Because if they're doing that, what are they not doing? They're not focused. They're not thinking about their customers. Right? If they're worried about what I'm doing and where I'm going, they're not thinking about their customers. And what does that do? It opens up an opportunity for me to think about their customers and for me to give an ear to their customers and for me to convert a customer for, of theirs to a customer of mine. Now, I go to their employees, too. Like, I'll go hire, I'll find out who the top sales reps are. And it is, I, day one, when I joined Domo, I found out the top 17 sales reps across our competitors. I personally emailed them all and then sent them books, selling for dummies. Swear to you. All right? Um, and then every single time I'm in a city where I know they're at, I hit them up. Hey, I'm going to be in Dallas. Let's have dinner. Hey, I'm going to be in Atlanta. Let's have coffee. Because if I could pull down the top sales reps, and sometimes they won't go. So you know what I do? I go in and I chop out some of, their, some of that sales rep support infrastructure. I'll go grab their account development person or their sales consultant. I'll do whatever it does to allow me to get the best talent. Now, why do I do that? Because my job is to, out, to, is to put the best team of athletes on the field. That's why, that's why focusing in on who you hire and your instincts, that's why that stuff's so critical. But also, if I can get the top sales reps thinking about me before they go to bed, they're not thinking about their customers. So I'm going to say, I would encourage you all, as you go out and you're, you're, you're entering a market, make sure, you're, make sure you've got an enemy. You know, I used to work for DirecTV, and uh, we were, you know, I was on the sales side, so I was out there getting, getting dealers that would carry the direct TV product to sell to customers. And as you'd go into new markets, and you'd see, you know, I'd go meet with this, cus this dealer that wants to be a, a, a satellite dealer of ours. The first thing I looked for was a, comp a competitor of theirs somewhere within a block radius. Because, if, because that meant they were going to be fighters. Does that make sense? Because if they didn't have competition around them, and especially consumer electronics, because Let's face it, you, you, you won't travel that far for it. So if they didn't have competition right around them, they weren't working hard for their business, and they weren't focused. So I say look for that. And I think the, the, com the common enemy thing, you know, again, it doesn't, I'm not trying to talk about swords and, you know, spears and guns and all. It's not that kind of enemy. You need somebody that you, that you can hate, right? I know it's, I know it's a school of love. It's Utah County and all that stuff, but... <laughs> I'm just saying, I believe, I believe having somebody to hate uh, in business, there's a, there's a definite advantage to you. And, and, it's, and being able to point all of your people, all of their time and attention at that kind of thing is incredibly valuable. So you want to make sure you've got competition. Okay? Well, and we'll go back to, to q and I'm going to wrap up with culture, and then we'll go into Q&A. Now, how many, how many lessons have you guys had on culture? Probably like 50? 
Not too many? Okay. Culture. What is, what is company culture? Why is it important? Yes, sir? It's everything. It's everything. Okay. Okay. It's the way you think, you act, how you believe, and how everyone interacts as a company. Okay. What else? It's great. Yes, sir. That's all right. Well said. Now, what does that mean? I want to, I want to double click on that because you're hitting on something that is, is absolutely critical. People don't leave companies. They leave who? They leave their leaders. They leave that culture. Right? And that's something you really, I don't, I don't know if you can get your arms around that, but it's true. They don't leave Domo. They don't. They leave because they don't like somebody's vision. They don't like something that's happening at their leadership level. Right? And that, that's all part of the culture. Great point. What else on culture? Okay. So let's talk about what, what the reason why culture is so, in my opinion, is so critical is that if you get culture wrong in a company, what's your solution? There's only one, by the way. Starting over. Do you realize that? That is truly the only solution if your culture goes, goes crazy. That's it. It's the only solution. Now, you could cut it off early. And like we, I gave you two examples of some pretty bad hires. You can cut it off early by finding someone who's actually not great culturally. And you can remove them quick. But, you know, sometimes it takes a while to figure that out. Right? But if you, if you truly, if your culture has not taken hold and you didn't control it, and you didn't foster it, and it becomes something you don't like, it's a cancer. I, I'm, I'm telling you, it's, I, if anyone tells you otherwise, I would challenge them on that process. I do not think there's alternatives. Because it, negative culture spins in negativity. Does that make sense? Right? So you guys got to really make sure that as you're, as you're focusing in on culture, you need to know who you are. You need to know who you want to be and what kind of culture and what kind of people you want around you. Hire people that you like. Now, did I say hire your friends? I didn't. Don't do that. <laughs> All right, unless they're cool. But, um, you know, for the most part, you know what I mean. Hire people that you like. You're going to be doing this for a long time. You're going to be in a role for 10 years in the trench with people you need to trust. And that culture is all part of that. So the reason we spend so much time at Domo in our interviewing process, all right, we're assuming that human resources has done their job before a person actually gets into the interview process. So the human resources has vetted them that their, you know, their resume is as it states. They, they were in these roles because people could certainly lie. They vetted all the, you know, all the basics, and the rest of us are looking for fit. Does this person culturally fit with us? Um, and so that's why we spend so much time. And to be fair, um, when I first interviewed with Josh, 2002, uh, again, they were making a million and a half dollars. He says three and a half, but I've seen the books. And so um, it's about a million and a half dollars. And uh, I, did, I was working in Farmington. He was down here in Provo. I was just <laughs> constant driving. Because he wanted to interview me about 18 times. I come down to do an interview. He's like, oh, yeah, I really like you. I, ah, I think there's going to be a fit here. And then he, you know, I went on my way. And he calls me back. He goes, hey, come down. Let's have breakfast. I'm like, I got to come up from, I got to come down from Farmington, chief. Like, that's a, you know. So I come down from Farmington. I do breakfast. He goes back. He's like, hey, let's, let's go to a football game together. All right, takes me to the BYU game. Oh, I'm not a fan. <laughs> All right, that was a test right there, because I'm a, I'm a Ute fan, so I was like, I had to, luck, luckily, we're playing the Utes, so, but, because um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be here before you today, I'd just tell you right now, I would, I would not have got that job. Um, come down, we want to go to dinner with our, you know, want to go to dinner with our wives, want to do, like, there was, a, you know, come down, do a business, you know, let's, let's present this business case, come down, interview someone for me, right, and that entire time, what was he trying to do? He didn't know it, right, but what was he trying to accomplish? cultural fit, right? Because arguably, 
even at a company of 38, right, uh, a mismatch in hiring the head of sales, especially because, you know, let's be fair, I'm, I'll, I'll be the second most boisterous person in the, in the company. Uh, a mismatch there is critical. Now, I will tell you just one little story, because I know we get into Q&A, but I actually thought I was getting the job, because, you know, I'm amazing. So I was like, <laughs> I was like, okay, today's going to be the day. He calls me, he's like, hey, let's meet at 5. And I was like, all right. So I'm on my way down. I'm, I'm role playing with my buddy on the phone. I'm like, all right, he's going to, he's probably going to offer me this, and I'm going to come back on this, and we were role playing everything. I had it all ironed out. And uh, <laughs> we sit down, and Josh takes his glasses off, and he goes, he goes, you have a-hole tendencies. <laughs> yeah. Right? <laughs> Which is probably true. I don't know. Right? And again, what was he looking for? He was putting me in, he was putting me in an awkward spot. How do I respond? What do I say? How do I deal with that? You know what I do with, you know what I do with salespeople all the time when they're interviewing? I ignore them. Why do I do that? Because guess who else is going to ignore them? Every single prospect they sell to. And if they can't get around that, and they can't sell something they know better than anybody else, which is themselves, they're never going to be able to sell me. So Josh was throwing me a curveball. You know, so I, I caught it. I handled my own. Gave a little feedback on why, be, you know, why, <laughs> why somebody may consider me an a-hole. Right? Because if you, you know, if you don't perform, I'm probably going to be rude. So, um, but again, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm challenging you. Make sure that you really, really spend time building your culture. Don't take any shortcuts. Because again, there's only one exit from making that bad decision. There's only one. So, with that, we'll open up Q&A. So you'll ask a question. I'll restate it as opposed to like running a mic around. Unless you want to talk on a mic, at which point that's up to you as well. It's, it's college. Any questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, so I'm reshading the question just for the camera. So again, the question is, he's got somebody that's a really uh, an aggressive operations manager. He's out in the field. Uh, sales guys bring in deals. He's pounding on their deals, the quality of the deals, et cetera. Your challenge is, let's bring him out to the field, get him to, you know, get him to actually be with customers, maybe quiet him down, calm his energy. And as a result, he also will come back and go, I'm going to show you while I'm out there why these deals aren't, uh, aren't good deals. And why you don't want the orders. Want the orders. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, uh, is this guy a brother-in-law or something? Because I got, I got an easy solution for that. Like <laughs> He's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, uh, it's, a great, it's a great question. And we, we've, you know, there's a, there's a, that's a common, a common point of conflict in a company, right? Sales, sales and support, or... In this case, operations, sales, and finance also a big, big conflict. Um, and I think part of the, you know, part of the challenge is like, well, is he right? Are the orders bad? Are the deals bad? Is there anything? Is there anything in there that's valuable that you can actually, you, know, you can give him some validation, but allow him to move over? Because part of the problem is you're in a human, you're, you're dealing with a human, right? And he's trying to fight for his position. And I think the more you push against his position, the more he kind of tends to hold on to it. So if you can give him any form of validation. Uh, in any way, and then and then kind of help him become part of the solution. I mean, I don't want to say manipulation, but um, you know, w what kind of orders does he want? <laughs> can you even get them? Yeah. Yeah. Because otherwise, he's just going to fight. He's just going to fight for his position, in my opinion. Yeah. Great. Other questions. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. 
Okay, so other than Domopalooza, what are you doing to cap, what is Domo doing uh, to capture kind of the minds and attention of other developers across the country? And what are you doing to be cool? All right, good question. Um, you know, it's, look, one of the things we're doing right now um, is we are trying to, we're starting to take some of the Domopalooza stuff across the country and across the globe. Uh, for example, my, my wife and I are leaving Saturday to go to Australia to do uh, a couple like mini Domopaloozas where we're presenting more about who we are, about the kind of opportunities that we have, uh, both as, you know, both for customers, partners, and also for uh, potential employees, and try to help, you know, kind of help people understand your culture a little bit, understand what we do and who we are. You know, Domo's, Domo's a bit different. We're one of those, uh, you know, we've got at any point in time, you walk into an, I walk into an enterprise customer that I'm selling to, like a, you know, like Nike, for example, and I'm competing with, you know, installations that have been there for you know 20 decades um, I'm competing with and, and and they've got one of everything that I compete with and so helping them understand how we're different and uh, you know the cool thing is I mean it's it's a it's a delicate it's a delicate balance in the end because uh, it's it's easy to be cool it's a little more challenging to be thoughtful and so I think as we're going out, we're trying to communicate the, the right message about, about what we're trying to build and how we're different. Um, and we're starting to take that kind of across the, the globe. We're also doing a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, we're sharing our customer success stories now. We've got a Domo 365 where we share a, a different success story every day. And that kind of starts to spin some of that energy uh, across the globe as well. I hope that answered your question. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. So, sorry, did I interrupt you? No. So, what do you say? Tell the people how Domo is. How is Domo? Okay. Great question. Okay. So, uh, his follow-up question is: You know, ten years ago, you were bringing people in because you had a pool table and you had an Xbox set up and a foosball table, and ping pong, and you know, free uh, free Skittles. Um, and kind of how are we different today? So it's, it's, it's a great point, right? As you walk through the, the Domo campus, which is scattered across uh, five, soon to be six buildings in American Fork, um, you know, we don't have foosball. We don't have pool tables. Uh, we, do, we do provide three square meals a day. We do, we do provide food. And, you know, it's an interesting thing. I think it's, uh, it, it's not like it used to be. I mean, I, you know, because I, I, I look at it, as I walk into, sometimes I walk into a customer and I'm, you know, I'm watching their kids, their, their employees walk around with shorts and <laughs> flip flops and, and ball caps. It, it's almost not really like that. And so the way we, you know, how do we communicate that? We communicate it by the things we're trying to accomplish. And, and, and also the demonstration of who we are. Uh, it actually, it actually kind of comes through. When they look at you and the people are saying, okay, this is someone I actually would like to work with, someone I'd like to learn from, um, that speaks so much more than somebody being able to play foosball during their break. Julie? Oh, yeah. We're also, I mean, today we're in, you know, we're in Portugal doing a hackathon where, you know, a lot of business students and agencies, et cetera, have to solve business problems in the Domo platform, you know, kind of doing some stuff like that as well. So great question. Yes, sir. Yeah. So the question is, what is our grand vision of Domo in terms of the in, in the enterprise market, and are the, the obstacles that we have to getting there? So, uh, you know, grand vision is you know it's big. Uh, it's like, you know, in our last round, so we've raised, you know, just over six hundred million dollars. We're valued at just over two billion dollars at this point. Um, 
we've got 900 employees and uh, you know 1,500 customers. Our our vision is that we will continue to change the way people are doing business, um, and that we'll do that across the enterprise. I mean, we're my you know we're 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 growing really really aggressively on that front. What are the challenges? You know, the challenges is that we're also doing something entirely different, um, and so getting you know getting brand awareness across the board, uh, making up for bad installations of previous competitive products. But when you walk in and they've got a legacy of negative uh, experiences in the category, you have, to, you have to fix some of that. And so I think those are the things that we're focusing in on now. And then just continuing to, you know, when you grow as fast as we grow, um, in terms of just the, you know, the humans themselves, going back to the stuff I just talked about, you know, how do you grow that fast and attract those, you know, that kind of number of people and maintain uh, the integrity of your culture across all of those people Offices, etc. It's, it's, it, that, those are the things I think would be you know, no, no, no different than anyone else's challenge. I would think. Yes, sir. Yeah. So the question is because uh, with Omnitrue being successful in the first round, of, go around with Josh. Now that we're at Domo, is, is you know, did we start with exit as a strategy? You know, one of the reasons that I, you know, that I chose to come work back, you know, work again with Josh because, you know, one of the one of the advantages I have when you take a company from a million and a half to an exit at 1.8, you kind of get to do a lot of pretty much what you want. Um, and so, uh, I was encouraged by a, a friend, you know, it was bad advice in the end, but he encouraged me to to interview 50 places before I actually before I actually took a role. That's a lot of interviewing, right? Um, and Josh was actually involved in a little bit of litigation with Adobe, so he and I couldn't talk. Like we could, you know, we could go eat to Denny's, but we couldn't talk. Um, so when we finally could, Josh was interview number forty-six, and I'd received forty-five job offers. Okay, um, but one of the reasons that that I liked it is that there wasn't an exit. Right, I didn't want to be in a situation where we were going to be acquired again. We've done that. I've learned my lesson. I'm good. Um, I feel like there's a lot of value in building a business for, the, for a very, very long time. Uh, you look at something like Salesforce, right? There's a reason that Mark Benioff has a hospital in his name. It's because he's been doing it for decades. And I feel like we were, you know, so one of the reasons that was very attractive to come back here is that there wasn't an exit. It was do you, how do you continue to grow aggressively and build a business that we're going to run until we're 70? That was kind of the thought. Good question. Other questions? Yeah. Oh, oh, ladies first. What rooster? What? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> it's, uh, I, why not? Right? That's kind of, so the, the rooster, there's one in the building, there's one, there, there's one on the building, there's one in the building, and the one in the building, we used to, when the sales team was all kind of co-located, we would, whoever was the top sales rep would have that sitting like right over their, their, their cubicle. So, rooster is just kind of an amazing image. And, and people want to go, what's about the rooster? So, <laughs> it works. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes, sir. So, a culture question. Uh -huh. um, you guys offer free meals a day. Yeah. What do you say to those people who say the reason you offer is because you want us here for all, all day long? Absolutely. So the question is, what? Sorry, I forgot to answer for the for the the camera. The question is, because we do offer three meals a day, what is our response to people who say we are doing that because we want them all day long? And the answer is, we absolutely want them there all day long. Right? I'm trying to build a place that makes you want to be here, that makes you want to stay. And if I can keep you from, you know, going out for an hour lunch, which usually is going to be an hour and twenty by the time you, you know. Everyone gathers, gets in the cars, does their thing, comes back, and gets back seated. If I can gain back half that time and make you more productive, why wouldn't I do that? So, I mean, that's my response. I don't know what the <laughs> HR price is something way different. <laughs> no, that's not it at all. <laughs> that's why I do it. So, <laughs> yes, sir. In the early days of Delmo or whatever, how did you get into some of the bigger companies like Amazon or Google? Like, what did you give them to bring up the business? Yeah, good question. The question is, in the early days of uh, Domo, when we, you know, how did we get into a Nike or any of these large accounts that, you know, 
that, that made us different? How do we open the door? You know, it's a great question. There's a lot, you know, when you, when you get into running a business and you start figuring out how do you open doors. How many of you have done summer sales like security? Right? Those are brutal jobs, right? Um, now, opening a door at home is way different than opening a business door. Right? It's, it's, it's a completely different mentality um, because these people are not spending their own money. And they're spending money that actually, you know, if they're over budget, they lose bonuses. There's a whole lot of different mind games going on. But they've also got a heritage and a legacy of bad decisions, perhaps, around my category. So, you know, we, we do all kinds of things. We do executive outreach where, um, you know, I will, be, I will be a champion and I'll just start hitting up everybody I know around this person I'm trying to get to. Uh, I do draw, I do drop eyes. I'll, you know, we've... Uh, We've, we've actually spun up an iPad, put a, you know, downloaded it with Domo data, the Domo app with, with like fake data, delivered it to a CMO and said, hey, you know, give me a call, yo. Uh, you know, you've got to do whatever you can to open the door. Now, once the door's open, right, that's when the battle really begins because it's, you know, you get in there, you've got, you know, like with an executive, you've got about four minutes and then they're going to kind of tune out. And so for us, we've got to be on, you know, on spot, um, we focus a lot, or a lot of our sales team, we focus them around curiosity because curiosity will keep somebody engaged, right? And so we've, we've trained them all on a, on, a, on a sales methodology that's all around curiosity. So these guys will ask a lot of questions and kind of keep that dialogue going because as long as the customer's talking, I'm selling, right? As soon as that customer's not talking anymore, I'm out. And I mean, it literally, it's, 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 it's the universal rule. So if you're out there selling and your customer's not talking anymore, your deal's done. Get the early plane home. So I hope that answered your question. Okay. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Do we plan on taking Domo public? It's a great question. Um, you know, right now, when you when we can raise money, uh, like we have, like you know, do we need public scrutiny? I don't know. I mean, um, look, why do people go public? They go public to, you know, for capital reasons. They go public for acquisition reasons. So, I mean, is that in the plans? Maybe. I don't know right now. Right now, we're not. Right now, we're just trying to execute, make sure our customers are satisfied, and uh, continue to build the business. But you know, I would certainly, yeah, I would certainly see that happening at some point. Here first, yes, ma'am. Um, so, to make sure I understand your question, so your question was, as a startup company, the with culture being so critical, what are the do's and don'ts? Um, to think about a culture. Uh, great, uh, it's a great question. Um, my, my opinion on a couple of these things, right? I think you've got to have a good, a good balance um, at the executive level. And at a startup, it may just be you, right? But at that level, you've got to have a, you've got to have a good balance of what I call leadership and management. Um, I know this class ends in three minutes. So leadership and management. Leadership, well, management's doing things right. Good process, organizational, tactical. Leadership is doing, thing, doing the right things. I think you've got to, I mean, if you don't have that at the executive level, in terms of understanding how to show somebody the vision that they can actually buy into, you're going to lose them quick. And, that, and I think that, that will be the first fracture inside a culture that you, you, you just you can't overcome. If, you're, like if, you, if all you do is micromanage, you're never going to get senior people to look at you, to come join your company. Because they're, they're, they're kind of beyond that in their career. Does that make sense? So I think you need a good balance of that. Um, the other thing is, I, I think being declarative about who you're going to be. Are you a product company? Are you a sales company? Right? Because there's how you, how you handle each one of those scenarios is subtly different. Right? If you're a sales company, but you're building a product, you know what happens to the product development roadmap? It's jerked around quite a bit. Customers start kind of, you know, muscling you a bit and saying, hey, we, we, need, we need to do this. We need to do that. So you need to be very declarative about what you want to accomplish and who you want to be. So I know that we're at 12, that, uh, 12.50 now. So. so thank you so much. Apologize. <laughs>